Welcome to the DRH Show. Today, I'm joined by a professor in psychology at Mississippi State University, Dr. Vicky Gaia. Thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. Well, it's, it's great to have you back again, um, um, Professor Gaia. And congratulations, by the way, because the last time that we spoke, um, you were not a professor yet, but um, we, we, we finally um, became a professor. Um, I won't ask you about your background anymore because um, the last time that we spoke, you actually give a good um, comprehensive background um, of, of what you do. So I'll just put the link to um, that um, prior interview so anyone can just watch it. But let's let's go straight into um, some of the aspects of the uh, of the research that you're doing, Professor Gaia. Um, I understand that you're currently working predominantly with older adults. And this 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 one single question that we often ask: um, Where do older adults live matter? Well, that's a really good question. Um, and I, if you don't mind, I want to give a little, a few statistics before we get into that question. Is that okay with you? Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Um, and the reason I'm doing this, I'm going to have to put my glasses on to read my screen, but the reason I did this is when we originally set this up, there, um, the spikes did, you know, that are going on right now in the Asian countries and in Europe right now are very scary for people all around the world, including um, the United States, because usually what we see happen, happening in Europe will show up on our doorstep within a couple of weeks. Uh, so I thought, you know, I'm just going to take a look and look at the data on worldwide cases and worldwide deaths this past Monday. And then on Wednesday, which was the, well, whatever the 15th was, yeah, I looked at it on the 13th and the 15th. So that was Monday and Wednesday. I wanted to see what kind of differences there were, just, just out of curiosity. I did not look at today's. I'm assuming it would be higher since the spikes are higher around the world. But this, this is what I found. I found that on Monday, on the total worldwide cases of, of COVID was 457 million cases. And on uh, the same date, the number of worldwide deaths was 6,040,000 and plus some. Now, in two days, it went from 457 million cases to 462 million cases, uh, which was on March 15th, which was just this past Wednesday. And then the number of deaths rose actually 10,000 deaths just within that two span period. And as we know, that number may very well be a whole lot higher because um, for instance, if you think of the way different people die at, at different ages, um, but older adults in particular, and they may have underlying, you know, health reasons why they may die suddenly, um, they may not know that they, you know, uh, died because they had COVID or was it because it was just time that their heart was supposed to stop? Do you see what I mean? And so oftentimes, I know in the United States, it's been claimed that a lot of times cases are not reported as COVID deaths. And I don't know if it's um, political or if it has anything to do with trying to take more fear out of people's lives. But uh, I personally would rather be told the truth and be safe than not to be. So I had looked that up. Um, but the other thing I want to say before we get into that big question is, Dennis, never in my life did I ever think that I would live through a worldwide pandemic. In the, in the United States, I think we are pretty naive in some respects, thinking that all these bad things like this happens to third world countries. You know, we don't expect it to happen to us. We we think that we will be prepared for something like this. And I think this has really caused a lot of people to start to pay attention more, hopefully more, um, to reality and not just hit hide their heads in the sand because, you know, they want to go out and have fun. So if you think about this in relation to 
older adults. And remember, today I'm talking about older adults in two categories, from the category from 65 to 79, and then the 80 plus, because these two groups really need to be uh, put together because they're so connected. Um, but, you know, if you think about it, and I and the thing is, is you don't have to think far because we've all have gone through this experience. Um, I don't know where you were or what you were doing when all of a sudden they said you have to stay in place, that there was a lockdown. Do you, do you remember what you were doing when you heard that news that, you know, mm. pretty much your life was going to change? Yeah, I, I actually remember I was volunteering at a local radio station and uh, I, I just heard that under um, lockdown measures were already in place and I thought it was just going to run for about two weeks, but I was quite surprised because it kind of go on and on and on. And yeah, there you go to the, the next thing I know. Um, we were already um, at home for about a year. So like, like what you said, that there's really a, a lot of things that the pandemic has has, has changed, not just, you know, um, the, the way we see things like like you, you've mentioned, it's not just, you know, like it's, it's everyone has been affected, um, especially, you know, the way we interact with each other. You're so you're so right. You're so right. So when this news came out, you know, that you had to stay in place and there were curfews and there were lockdowns, um, I really didn't know what to think. But like you, I thought, well, this is probably only going to last a few weeks, surely. And of course, all of, in academia, all of our classes went immediately all online, which I had no problem with because I had taught online before and my other classes were hybrid. So I was very comfortable in making that transition. But you know, a lot of faculty members were not prepared because they were not online teachers. And so that, that was a transition for them. But with older adults, when you think about this, all of a sudden they're thinking, what do you mean I have to stay in place? I can't go out. And it depends on where they live, just how um, big of an impact this was. So for instance, um, if you are, 65 and 79 year old age range and you're you're retired let's say which by the way most people aren't retired at 65 anymore many people are working you know, up into their 80s and if they're still healthy working depending on what kind of work you do for instance in academia it's not unusual to have an 80 year old uh, um, professor if they are still cognitively functioning and contributing right so this is a great area to be in if you want to work for a long time on your choice you don't have to but my my question is why wouldn't you if it keeps your brain acting right you're still being able to think so but what if you're one of these lucky people that happen to be you know, multimillionaires and you're like, well, I've worked very hard to make that money. And now I want to retire and me and my significant other and, or my family, you know, we want to travel. We want to do all these things. Um, but all of a sudden you're told, no, all those plans are on hold. You're going to stay in place. Um, all these curfews, these lockdowns. And for these older adults who are not so fortunate and who are living on, you know, the bare minimums to get get by, maybe their social security allows them to, you know, be comfortable, but not the same as they were back when they were working and making, you know, really good money. Um, so you think about how does this affect them? Well, it affects them on so many multiple levels. For instance, many older adults are very involved in a church life. And so there went their, their friends, their community of church um, on Sundays and some denominations also we uh, meet during the week as well. And if you are, if you happen to be um, an older adult who lives alone, uh, maybe your significant other, your spouse has died, this could be catastrophic if all of a sudden you're cut away from all of these things. So when we heard about this fear, or we, we heard about this uh, COVID, um, I don't think anybody knew just how bad it was going to be until we started to hear and we started to watch the videos with the um, refrigerated trucks backed up to nursing homes and to um, hospitals. And you saw bodies on top of bodies on top of bodies and body bags 
uh, just waiting to be taken, you know, to a place where they could be held until they could be uh, either cremated or to be buried. I mean, so the fear started to build and to build and this fear was real. The fear was, you know, intense. And of course it was uh, very, very deadly. Those older adults who um, were in long-term nursing facilities were the first ones, at least in the United States, that got hit the hardest. I don't know if that was the same in the UK. Do you remember if, if it was the older adults that were hurt? Uh, hit first yeah yes it's, it's pretty much the same um scenario here. Oh, okay so then you understand what i mean so we're watching on tv and we're watching interviews in nursing homes and in hospitals and of course the majority of the people are 65 or older and a lot of them are 80 plus and um you know your heart just start breaking when you watch these stories especially well not especially either one is just as tragic but when you're looking at the nursing home situations you're thinking about here these people are in a nursing home they may be cognitively perfectly fine but their body has kind of given out on them so they they needed and too much help for their family to be able to keep them at home. And so now they're in a nursing home. Now, so maybe in this nursing home, they have learned to adjust. They've learned because some nursing homes, especially the better ones, they have activities every day for the older adults. Well, all of a sudden this ends. All of a sudden their room has become like a prison to them. They're not allowed to leave. They may have had a roommate who has now been moved out either because that roommate has died or because they are trying to social distance as best as they can. So now you have an older adult who may be spending all day long, you know, in the room, like a prison really, only seeing people coming in in these like hazmat suits because they're trying to be careful, which you cannot blame them in any way, shape or form. Um, and, and basically only being able to do the basics for them, you know, taking care of their hygiene, making sure they're fed, um, but not the normal everyday sit down and chat with them for a little bit. So that, you know, is heartbreaking. And then those who don't have any, any relatives who were coming to visit them in the first place and only relied on those residents, you can imagine how um, devastating that had to be, had to have been for those people. I just, I just can't even um, imagine that. So, you know, when these mandates came out and we listened to them in, in our homes, um, at first, a lot of people, I think, may have had um, a little bit of a negative attitude towards it, thinking, oh, they're exaggerating, it's this, that, or the other. But in reality, you know, these mandates were needed obviously, because if they hadn't been enforced, uh, how they had been enforced, um, we would have had a whole lot more cases. So we know that the mandates were important, but at what cost? At what cost, especially for older adults? Because the older adults, all of a sudden, their lives changed so dramatically, and we'll talk about those different dramatic ways and how it had an effect on um, you know, their lives um, in the nursing home or even if they were stay at home. Research is showing uh, both in the UK and in the United States that more and more older adults in their 80s and 90s mm -hmm. are aging at home. Um, some of them are just downsizing into smaller homes. Some of them are moving into apartments, but they're not moving into long term uh, uh, community mm -hmm. centers or nursing homes or assisted livings as early as they used to. So they're liking staying home. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. that that's something to, to consider. Mm -hmm. I wanted to share on a personal note that this whole story is very um, personal to me because uh, on August the 2nd of 2020, I had my brother who at the time was 70, uh, eight years old die from COVID. And I found, I didn't actually find this out until two days later when I found out from my oldest son that their father, which was my first husband, 
had also died and he was six, only 66 years old, just a year older than me. And I, I will confess to the world, I was in shock. I did not know how to handle this information. Because remember, I live in Mississippi. My brother lived in Florida. My ex-husband lived in Las Vegas, Nevada. There were traveling bands. And even if you were able to get there, you couldn't go to a funeral. There were no funerals. They had so many backed up bodies just to take care of them and burying them or to cremate them. There were no final goodbyes. Now, some places were really uh, very um, humanitarian, humanitarian reasons, I think. Um, they would have virtual funerals for the family, but there were still so many of them, you probably had to be kind of high up on some kind of a list to be able to have that done. So I didn't go, get to go to either of those funerals. I have yet to be back to Florida, and I did never go to, to Vegas to see my ex-husband, but um, when they had died, if they had died normally without a pandemic, I would have attended both of their funerals and they both would have had military funerals, which is a really big deal. I don't know if you've ever been to a military funeral. No, no, I've never been, been but I, I would imagine it's, it's, it's quite, um, ceremony, uh, you know, it it's is very, very yes. I mean, the, the shooting of the guns and the pulling mm. of the flag. I mean, just watching it, you don't even have to know the person, but even watching it is very emotional. And we did not get to have that happen. And for anybody who is listening and you live in a country where they have those, in the United States, the VA, the Veterans Administration, has has put together um, um, a plan that once the family can travel to where their significant other has passed, that they will still, no matter how many years, if it's five years, 10 years, they will still get that um, ceremony. Interestingly, you can even have it at your own home. So let's say I say, I can't, and I'm not going to be traveling again to say Florida. I can arrange to have that service literally brought to my church um, or to my own home and have family gather and, you know, celebrate life in a memorial type of a service, which we have not been able to do. So that was, you know, um, very, very hard. The other loss that I had actually um, is, is quite touching to me right now is because today was a six month anniversary of my service dog dying. Now my service dog was just a little miniature pincher um, he was not an official service dog, as in he went through training, but he was unique in that he knew when I was going to pass out due to low blood pressure and my heart rate going down extremely low. And he saved my life on many occasions. And to have him die in my arms six months ago from being poisoned from some from dog food um, did something to me. It did something that I'm still not recovering for. I still have days that I break down, like just as if this was a, a close family member, because our pets are our close family members. If you are close with your pet, they, they provide you with so much unconditional love. And then all of a sudden, you know, that precious life was gone. So that also helped me become more empathetic with people who tell me now that their animals have died. And I hear this all the time with my students and even with my grandchildren when they lose their pets. And so this, this has had added more to um, my empathy. I mean, I always felt sorry for people who lost pets, pets but I never understood the gravity of it. So um, I think about this. I wanted to look up... Mm -hmm. Um, specific cases, the United States, the Philippines, because that's where you grew up, and then the United Kingdom, because that's where you're living. So I looked up again on the same dates as I had looked before, but, but what I was looking at was um, total cases and deaths. In the United States, the total cases um, was 79.4 million. In the Philippines was 3.67 million. 
In the United Kingdom, it was 19.6 million. Um, in the deaths, the United States was 966,000. Philippines, 57,441. And deaths, 163,000. Um, and so that, you know, that, those, looking at the different countries and seeing, uh, making it, ma making it really real to me, how many people have died in so many different countries. And it's made me interest, uh, interested in doing a little more research on mm -hmm. other countries to see how much they have suffered. Yeah. So then when I was looking at statistics, I thought, you know what, I want to look at one more thing. And that's how many older adults mm -hmm. do people have in these countries? And um, what I found was over 50 million senior citizens live in the United States, making up 16.5% of the population. And in the United Kingdom, um, you have, it said that uh, between 21 and, and 2022, you're going to have a rise in 1.6% of the population. And so that's the highest that, um, you, you know, they have ever experienced. So it's not just us. Sometimes, you know, people in the United States think the world kind of evolves around us and we don't so much look outside. Now this is making it more real and saying the world is aging. It's not just the United States, right? Um, we're, we have to quit being so egocentric and thinking the world evolves around us. So you asked me earlier you know, where older adults live and why it matters. And of course, it matters a lot when it comes to this pandemic. Um, the majority, like I said, of, of uh, older adults are now living at home if they physically can um, with a significant other, but many of them are actually living on their own. Um, some of them live with extended families with sons and daughters and grandchildren. So, uh, it, you have intergenerational living within a household. Um, and like I mentioned, there are some that are living alone. And when it gets to the point where they can't do that, oftentimes they will move into what we call assisted living, um, which is a really nice uh, uh, opportunity if you have the money to do it. Assisted living, you oftentimes will have a small apartment, or depending on the community and how much money you have, you may have a, a very small house, but you have the freedom to choose if you want to eat at home or if you want to eat with the community. So you have an option to be around other people when you want to be around other people and to be alone when you don't want to be alone. I, I was just going to say, because um, obviously that, um, you know, that that level of interaction is really important because it's, it's not just, you know, it's not just the deaths and, and the, the, the physical aspects, but it's also more about the loneliness. So I was just wondering, because you, you've clearly illustrated how, you know, how we have been affected, not just on an individual level, but also on a community level. Um, what, would you also say that loneliness also um, translates into that kind of, you know, um, d different levels within individual group and, and community? Um, I, I'm, I'm talking in particular about uh, isolation. Yes, I, I, and I'm going to actually be talking quite a bit about loneliness, so I'm glad that you brought that up. Um, during all those th those times that people were being separated, of course, one of the first things that happens when you're separated, because we are human beings and we're not mean meant to be separated from people for long periods of time. Matter of fact, research shows that um, oftentimes people um, who live in isolation, die earlier deaths because of that. Um, and because of the loneliness sets off other psychological factors, which, um, of course, yes, uh, the, the loneliness factor um, in living alone all by yourself is really hard. But it's not just those that are living alone. It's also those that have a significant other with them. Because you would think having another person with you would take away that loneliness, but there's so much more to your life than just one other person, usually, right? Usually there's more to your life than just one other person. There's there's family, uh, extended family. There's friends. In my case, there were my students. I miss my students dearly. 
um, there's church organizations, there's senior centers where they have all kinds of activities and dances and, um, you know, uh, group trips, you know, short trips, or, you know, around the state and sometimes even longer. Uh, so all of a sudden when you're cut off from that, you can, you can just think how loneliness uh, has made a very big impact. Um, and it is just the, the beginning springboard of so many psychological disorders that older adults and young, younger too, in addition to early deaths, um, you can actually die, you know, from loneliness because that pain I have learned from loneliness is actually felt in your brain in the same place where you feel physical pain. So if, if somebody is like, I don't quite understand why you, what the pain feels like when you feel lonely, then think about when you have suffered any other kind of pain, whether it's physical or emotional pain, pain is pain. And that's a fa affecting our cognitive functioning because when you think about it, if you are extremely lonely, going through depression, you're having anxiety, um, all of these things are going on, your life is not going to be the same, even if you're trying to follow the everyday uh, routine that you've set in place. Um, loneliness with older adults often um, can, can be triggered by not being able to see people that you wouldn't maybe normally think of. And that's and if you know older adults, you'll know what I'm talking about. Oftentimes, older adults look forward to going to their doctors. And when I was younger, I used to think, oh, you've got to be kidding me. The last place I want to go to is the doctors. But if you live alone and you go to your doctor and you have and you have a good doctor and a good you have good nurses and people that work there, they are very good with with older adults. They know that especially if they know that they're living alone they know that touch is so important so think about what what the change is going from going to your doctors and you know some older adults have to go several times a year for you know checkups i have to go several times a year due to my heart and other issues and um during this pandemic i have found that I went home and laughed a little bit because I probably talked their ears off because I was what I call face hungry. I had not seen people in person other than my husband, sometimes for months at a time. And so I felt this like face hunger and I would apologize and they would always say, no, 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 we just love talking to you. Well, whether they did or not, how, I, how grateful that made me feel um, to be able to do that. So even thinking of that, you know, is um, um, amazing. Those older adults who did not have those close friends and families um, and their personal space is completely relied upon other people. I want you to think about this. How would you feel? Because you're a young person. I think you shared that in our last uh, uh, interview that you're 40 years old. Is that yeah, correct? I am. Yes. So you're young. You're so young. You're younger than my, my son. So um, anybody that's younger than my sons, I'm always going to say are young. So you are young and appreciate uh, your your age. 40 is a great age. Um, 40, the 40s and 50s and even 60s, believe it or not, um, that, you know, so far I'm experiencing that that they have been, been um, really great. But if you don't have personal context and you're kind of alone and all of your safe zone, you know, meaning people who are going to be bringing items to your house because you cannot go out, you're depending completely on other people. This is really hard for this particular population, especially the 80 and older population who want to be independent. And this is because, and even the, the 65 to 79 year olds, because we have grown up in the Western world as being told from day one that we need to be independent. We don't want to be dependent on, on anybody else. Um, other cultures, there are other cultures that are just the opposite, that they think about the community, they think about 
others. But in the United States, they are, they really focus and teach their children. You know, not that they're saying don't care about others, but they will say things like you focus on your own work when you're at school. You know, don't pay attention to your friends and what's going on with them. You've got to get the grades so that you can go to college and, you know, so on. And so um, these are people that are not used to saying, I need help. And that can, it can be a little depressing for these people. Um, and it also, when you're thinking about their mental health, um, and you've never experienced mental health before. Maybe these people have been pretty lucky and healthy throughout their life. Everybody in their life at some time has had depression and anxiety. But there are some people who have been pretty lucky and have gotten through it without too much in their life. And now, wham, bam, they've got it in their face. And they may not know how to actually deal with this. And so... I'm going to be talking about four different psychological disorders, and I'm so glad you brought up loneliness because social isolation is the key when it comes to um, a pandemic or um, the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic that we're currently having right now. Um, this, this social isolation is going to contribute to loneliness, is going to contribute to depression, and is going to contribute to um, anxiety. In my research on that, I was trying to think of things that were also positive. And so I found that there are some personality traits that perhaps if we can learn now and spread this uh, to all age groups, but especially older age group people, um, if we have to go through this again in another you know, a couple of months or in a year from now, they can uh, maybe remember some of this and build on some of these positive personality traits uh, to help them get through this a little bit better. You, of course, are going to be, you know, my number one here with the, um, you know, with your being a professional blogger and a, a YouTuber and, you know, you do so well and you excel so well um, on this. You know, I'm I'm hoping to learn a little bit more about that, if you don't mind sharing. Yeah, yeah, what sure. Because um, well, the, the the way I see what what I do is it, it's it's a form of coping mechanism. It's a form of um, escapism. If it's not a coping mechanism, um, so um, but basically what I'm doing is that I'm I'm, I'm carrying out a research whether we can find out whether blogging content creation can be a source of resilience, whether we can adapt it as a resilience intervention to help young people boost their levels of resilience. And um, I, I suppose we have a shared um, interest, Professor Gaia, because your work is you know, tr trying to um, help people address their feelings of loneliness and isolation, and that's also within the realm of positive psychology. Um, but um, what, what I'd like to hear from you is that, um, are, are there many, many other areas of positive psychology? Are there other areas of positive psychology that you're also interested to work on? Um, I'm very interested in, as, as you mentioned, in resilience. Um, because I th think that's a key factor um, when it comes to, you know, positive psychology in general. But when I teach, I get to teach positive psychology once a year, and which uh, was a blessing in disguise. I had no idea I was going to love it as much as I do, because remember, I'm an experimental cognitive psychologist. And so getting to teach positive psychology allowed me to learn more about what positive psychology is, how it can help people with their coping mechanisms, how they can be a better person. And I love the whole idea of positive psychology is the fact that you are trying to be the best that you can be. And how can you help your fellow man? It's not just, you know, um, um, just about you. It's about others as well. And so this is why I think it's so important when we think about the different areas and in, in, in positive psychology, just social isolation uh, has such a terrible impact 
on our cognitive impairment, um, on our immunity system, on our cardiovascular diseases, um, and ultimately mortality. And if you think about it, Dennis, what's think about it when somebody gets sent to prison. Okay, let's say they get in a scuffle in the yard. I'm going by TV shows because I've never been in a prison. But where do they usually put these people for punishment? Those ones that have done something that they shouldn't be doing in prison. Um, that they would they would isolate you. Exactly right. They put you in solitary confinement. Okay, think about children. What do parents sometimes do when children have misbehaved, even little bitty ones? So they learn very quick about um, getting in trouble. What, what's the worst thing you can do to a little child if they're in trouble? Uh, you, you would ground them. You would remove all the privileges that they enjoy and you exactly. would also make them you know, feel isolated. You're making them feel isolated. You're taking away their freedom. You might be putting their little noses in the corner. That's very popular, you know, because you're not ca causing harm. And depending on the age, you're supposed to go by a time frame. Like if they're two or three years old, you don't leave them there for 15 minutes or a half an hour. You do it for like two or three minutes and they get the drift. You know, um, or sometimes they will isolate them by making them sit out on the side. They do this in schools a lot and they watch their peers get to play recess, but they don't get to because they've done something wrong. Right. So taking away um, their freedom, taking away it, it's very powerful. We know that that's very, very, very powerful. Um, so social, social isolation um, has so many effects. Um, and I, I read this one article, I got to put my glasses on it to, to look at this again, but I let it, read this article the other day that had uh, done a, a meta analysis of 65 articles and they have investigated the isolate, uh, the association between isolation and cognitive functions in later lives. And what they found Dennis was that when you have low levels of social isolation, so you're not isolated that much, and you have high engagement in social activity, and you have a large social network, that your cognitive functioning will last much longer as you get older. So this is something that we should take you know, into consideration. This is something we need to share with um, these 65 to 79 year olds and plus, um, because if they're thinking long range that they want to stay healthy, they also need to be staying active. Now you might think, well, but we're in the COVID or we're in a pandemic, how active can you actually stay? And so, so that's one of the, another one of the things that I want to bring up about how we can introduce older adults to ways of interacting with people to not feel as isolated, which in turn would not make them as lonely or hope and hopefully uh, decrease depression and as well as anxiety. Anxiety is my demon in my life. So um, I know anxiety, um, it, it, it's horrible for everybody, but I have felt deep depression before in my life. And I think to myself, Boy, you put all of that together, loneliness, social isolation, depression, anxiety, that's just setting people up for early premature um, mortality when you think about older adults. Now, I, I, I just want to ask you, because we've been talking about loneliness, um, Professor Gaia, and a lot of research has shown that there's a, a link, a strong link between loneliness and suicide. So I was wondering if... Or over the course of your research, um, have you found significant difference between, you know, um, suicide between males and females, especially among older adults? Yes, the, the one of the biggest things that I have found, and I didn't realize the the difference was so large and so until I came across it in my research, and that is suicide. Um, the rate of suicide for females. Um, it, they're pretty much kind of 
equal up to around four, age 45. And at 45, the age of suicide decreases significantly, almost a barely nothing um, into older age. And, all, and But males from 45 and on, especially at 70 and on, has increased significantly. And there's a lot of variables that can contribute to that. And a lot over the years where they've talked about that. And one is the loss of a, a spouse. Um, and, and the fact that um, not all, you cannot say all, but oftentimes females have a larger social network than males do. Uh, oftentimes males settle into their family setting and their life evolves around work and their social setting where females may work, have their social setting, but also have their friends on the side with where if something were to happen to their, their spouse or significant other, they wouldn't be totally lost. They would know, hey, I have this person, this person, and this person that I can fall back on. And research has even shown that if you have even one person in your life, that that's your go-to person, that's your, you know, um, no matter what is going on in your life, you can tell them there's unconditional um, love there, if you want to say, um, and it, it can help a person. It can save a person by having that one good friend. So yes, um, maybe a lesson learned is, is teaching our males, you know, from, you know, going through school at all levels uh, and also, um, doing some things in businesses uh, to have them interact with people more often um, so that when they get to older adulthood, they don't think suicide is the way out. Even though I completely understand if you were suffering beyond means and um, you also were suffering uh, physical pain where that might enter their mind, but they may not think about it or carry it out if they had somebody to talk to. And I think this can happen at any age because I have heard people your age make comments like, oh, I feel, man, I feel like I'm 60 today. You know, of course I chuckle when I hear that because I'm 66, um, but I know what they're talking about. I remember when I was 40 thinking 66 was pretty darn old. Um, and then you have people who are, um, in their 70s and 80s. And when you talk to them, they say, you know what? I don't feel 60 or 70 years old. And my father actually sat down with me when he was in his early 70s and had a talk with me that I always appreciated. My father was 40 years older than, than I was. And so this, this talk meant a lot to me. And he told me, he said, Vicki, I know when you look at me, you see this old man you know, because I'm 40 years older than you. But in my mind, in my brain, I'm still like in my 40s. I still feel like I can go out and be able to do these things, even though maybe my body is not letting me do all that I want to do. Now, my parents were up until into their 70s were ballroom dancers, and that kept them very healthy and very active. But when once their ailments said, started to come into play, they missed that, you know, significantly. And so research found, and I found this article on subjective aging and how that makes such a big difference. And what they found is with older adults, if you hear them saying that they feel that they are an age much older than what they actually are, that can actually be detrimental to their health by bringing on psychological and physical problems. And so I thought that was interesting because subjective, you know, you, people don't always think about that, your subjective age versus your chronological age. And so, and I know some days I wake up and I feel, you know, I think to myself thoughts that I'm used to think in my 30s and my 40s. And then sometimes I have to stop and think, well, I can't quite do that right now because of a health issue or um, especially right now, I can't do anything because of, of, of fear of getting uh, a worse case of, of COVID. Um, but that's something to, to keep in mind, you know, with research is to throw that, 
when, when I'm doing research on older adults, throw that, how old do you really feel versus what your chronological age is? Um, I, I was just going to ask you, um, um, Professor Gaia, um, let, let's talk something um, more exciting. Um, what, what, what about looking for relationships, in particular online relationship as an adult? Yes, that's a very good question. Again, this is when people need to have a talk with the children of these older adults, because sometimes when older adults lose their significant other, whether it's through death or divorce, um, sometimes their children are a little leery of their older adults seeking out a companion, right? Um, they think you're too old to be going out there looking for somebody. What are you doing? You know, go, go to church and find somebody. That's what, when I got divorced, my, my, um, and this was when I was, we got to think when I was 48, um, um, actually it was when I was right at 50, um, my, my kids would tell me why, you know, why are you looking online? Cause that's when online, you could go online and, and, um, you didn't have to pay for it back then, uh, back then, uh, uh AOL had this site called love at AOL.com. And you could basically pe uh, put up a picture with a little blog of yourself and a contact uh, information. And uh, you would have like an email com uh, uh, connection. And that's actually how my, my husband and I met. And we, um, we uh, in, on November the 15th, we'll, we'll be married. Um, we remain, we'll be married 18 years. So, um, you know, that's, that's doing, that's doing pretty, pretty well. Um, what are we going to think? No, I'm lying. It's going to be, it's going to be 19 years because we got married in 22. We met in, in 2000 and we got married and, uh, we got married in 2003. So that's right. So um, I'm getting close to that 20 year uh, marriage. But but I told them, I said, what am I supposed to do? Walk into a bookstore and pick up a book and uh, just sit there and watch guys walk by and then, you know, kick up a conversation. I said, how does that differ than you going into a bar, you know, looking for somebody? Now, I'm not going to be a bar fly and go looking for somebody. I'm going to be a lot safer and I'm going to be sit, uh, checking people out online before I even meet them. Um you know, we were talking. You were talking about uh, positive psychology, um, and th there's a, a, a quote in an article that I read that said, um, "Faced with uncertainty, it is common for people to seek positive solutions." And this, in the nutshell, is kind of what positive psychology is really about, right? It's it's looking for the positive in things instead of looking for the negative. And so in this one article, they gave nine different um, areas that he, that for of all ages is interesting to look about and to reflect upon. But if you have people in your life you who are older, you know, 65 and older, you know, and 80 and older as well, this may be something you would want to reflect with with them. And this is what they found. Number one thing was meaning in life. They found that if you have, if you report that your life is meaningful. And so if Dennis, when I say that to you, um, is your life meaningful? What, what would you say makes your life meaningful right now, currently in your life? Well, I would say my, my family and my husband, um, that, that those are the things that are really important to me. That's good. And you know what? You should add what you're doing. What you are doing with, with your YouTube show, because I've watched many of your YouTube shows, um, you are helping so many people. You, you may, Hopefully you know by looking at the numbers that people watch um, how many people you are helping on so many levels and on so many interesting topics. And so, you know, sometimes I don't think that we think about the things that we do in our lives that are meaningful. Um, and people, when they ask us what's meaningful in our lives, of course, we think personal relationships. So you think family, you know, um, 
it, whether it's is a spouse or if it's extended family, maybe very close friends. Um, what gives meaning for me in my life right now um, is one getting to to do these uh, YouTube shows with you. This has brought great joy to my life. Thank you very much. Um, in addition to that, teaching and being with young people and being able to share as much as I can about my life and mistakes I have made in my life to help them not make the same mistakes and to provide a forum and, and a setting for them to be able to come and get mentoring and help with me because I will stick with them through their, their academic process. So if they're continuing on to a master's or PhD program, they know that they can always count back on Guy or they can always call back and say, hey, this is happening. What do I do? And so that kind of thing is giving me great, you know, great meaning in life. And even through COVID, thank goodness I still have my students, even though they're online, I have that. Um, but when you think about the role uh, coping plays with stress and trauma and all the things that are going on in life, um, meaning in life can actually buffer what we're going through with COVID. So if we stop back and we think to ourselves, what is meaningful in life? And we think of the good, the good things, it often can help us sort of forget what's going on, you know, around us in the negative. The second, which is something that you have brought, a term you have brought up already, and that's coping. And we have found through research that if you have positive coping skills instead of negative coping skills. So, for instance, if, if I were to ask you, uh, and I don't mean you personally, I mean people in general, uh, what is what are a couple of negative coping skills that people use to escape? What would you say? Uh, uh, alcoholism and addiction and, and also, you know, being engaged in um, um, unhealthy relationships. Very good. And I, I might also add in my, my past experience with people is some risk taking behaviors, right? Doing things that people shouldn't be doing and they do it anyway and have negative consequences the rest of their lives. Um, so we have found that if you have positive coping skills, um, the more positive your coping skills are, they are saying the less stressed you're going to be, the less anxious you're going to be, and the less depressed. So that's something for people to look into. The third, I really liked this one, is self-compassion. And I don't think people do that for themselves. So many people are looking after other people that they don't stop and think, what are my needs? What do I need to hear from myself? So sometimes you need to, you know, you're not crazy if you talk to yourself. When I'm at home, I carry on conversations with myself when I'm all alone. And that's perfectly fine. I have no problem with me doing that. Um, and, and nobody should. You should be able to talk out loud, sometimes even verbalizing something out loud, which if you if you if you've ever been in counseling, you know, that's pretty much what you're doing in counseling. A counselor isn't there to solve your problems. They're get you there. They get you to talk. Talk about it. Right. So if you're verbalizing these things, that's going to help. So they're saying that you should actually tell yourself with self-compassion. You need to. um, um if you have self-compassion, it's going to help people face their daily stresses a whole lot better. Um, it's going to help them reduce illness, um, more, not so much illness, but ill being, I guess they call it, and promote more well-being. So you need to have self-compassion so you then can have compassion for others. The fourth is probably a no-brainer. That's courage to get through COVID-19. Um, and they found that in the area of COVID um, research on COVID, they found that um, when people have shown kindness to other people, for instance, old, if you are able to connect with an older adult, even though maybe it's through the internet or um, you know when when they're allowing them and um, they're allowing people to go into nursing homes now, but when the lockdown comes in, you know 
you got to think then how can I can keep communicating with these people I've made relationships with or or um, how about the people during COVID that took the risk? I don't know. I'm sure you see the same kind of news as we do in the UK. And that is how so many restaurant businesses and uh, individual chefs would make. And I, it's, it boggles my mind. They may make a thousand meals a day and people are distributing these meals all over their city. And I think, wow, how fascinating is that? For you to do that why because you are risking your life if you are one of these uh, people who are delivering the the meals you could be risking your life by by catching the virus but these people are thinking beyond themselves they have the courage and they say courage plays a special role during crisis so um i think that's a good one when i teach positive psychology, my very favorite chapter is gratitude. And matter of fact, I have students sit down and they, they uh, make a list uh, of people who that have done things for them in their lives that have been spectacular. But then I ask them to narrow it down to one person. They can always do it more on their own. But for the assignment is that they pick one person that has done something for them in their lives that they are just so grateful. And maybe they've never told anybody this. Now, think about this with 65 and 80 plus people. This is something you could do with these people, um, whether it's your grandparent or just a friend of the family or, you know, whatever as a psychologist going in and sharing this information with a group of people in assisted living or in um, a nursing home. Talk about gratitude. And they said, in the face of crisis and during troubling times, um, people rely on positive feelings to cope and they turn to gratitude oftentimes to be able to get through that. Um, what I have my students do is to actually write a letter to that person uh, and then to read that letter to that person. And it's often, oftentimes an emotional time, but how wonderful, what a joy, what a gift to that person for them to hear words from maybe, you know, a, a grandchild or even a friend, maybe they had done something for them in their life that they didn't realize what a difference they made in their life and to hear that. So doing positive things like that, having these positive approaches and using gratitude is just fantastic. The sixth thing, and there's only nine, the sixth thing is positive emotions. And they basically, that, that's probably a no brainer. Uh, the consequences of positive emotions has a big effect on mental physical and public health. So we really need to, as best as possible, if you see yourself drifting towards the negative, try to do what you can do to reel yourself back in and think of the good times. Think, think of happy times. The seventh thing is positive interpersonal processes. And this I love too, because it takes so little to make somebody happy. And this is something else I do in my positive psychology class. You can make a person's day by putting a stick up note on their car window in a store that just says something very positive. You know, like, you know, the world's a better place because you're in it. Or just, you know, some little saying um, to, to make them feel better. Um, it, they also said that laughter, and I think we all know that, laughter can be contagious. Have you ever been around people that has especially a cute, unique laugh, and they laugh, and you have no idea why, why you're laughing, but you're laughing with them? We know through research that if you get somebody to laugh, even if it's a fake laugh, if you get people to laugh, they feel better. It works the same with the smile. And I think I might have mentioned this before in, in my studies um, with you, but there's a study that if you put a pencil, you know, above your lip and hold it there and then put it in your mouth and hold it there, one's going to be creating to the brain a signal that, oh, my face is, is lifting up, therefore I must be happy, therefore I feel better. And if it's down and you're frowning, 
it's sending the same message to your brain. So smiling a lot to people, getting people to laugh, that can be such a positive thing um, during this horrible time, you know, this, during this pandemic pandemic um and in in life in general i mean i come home from work and i you know the first thing i'm usually saying is the funniest thing that happened at work today was and you know it makes me laugh and so i'm sure i know from research i'm far from the the only person that feels that way the eighth is having a high quality of connections um older adults who spend quality time with people family and friends, report less loneliness, anxiety, and depression. And the last thing that they talk about, and I'll shut up on this, but I think these nine points were very important, was strength of character. And they said um, that uh, this plays a role in building reliance, uh, building, oh, sorry, not reliance, resilience in people. Uh, a good strength of character shows that you can bounce back from things. I've heard your story about your life, Dennis, and I know that you are a very resilient person. Am I correct? Do you feel like you um, yeah. practice resilience? Yes, yes. Um, uh, th thank you for um, bringing out uh, my, my life story um, in relation to resilience. Really appreciate it. Uh, by the way, Vicky, we need to wrap up now because it's um, really... Um, over an hour. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> so time goes by so so fast when we're having fun. So what I want to give in, in a nutshell on the internet, I can sum this up really quick, is that a lot of older adults have never been on the internet and they're afraid of it. Um, and uh, people who are tech savvy and have experience should take the time to sit down with uh, older adults who have the capability to do so and show them how you can meet people through groups, uh, teach them how to go into a group and how to behave in the group before committing to the group because you don't want them to get into anything, you know, that they shouldn't be getting into. Um, they may need some kind of a support group. It may be a support group um, because they are addic have addictions like alcoholism or drug addiction, or it may be a support group because they've lost somebody. You know, you can help them find this, and that will help alleviate a lot of these problems. Um, you can teach them to look for groups that they have a similar interest in. So do they garden? Do they weave? Do they read books do they what do they do and, and you can help them out a lot by this um and lastly you know and we were talking about this earlier earlier is that remember that um you can stay connected with people through the internet and when i say the internet i almost also mean like what we are doing right now or with zooming zooming has brought so much um, less loneliness to my life, and I know it can with other people as well. So what I, my last words I want to say to people is to celebrate each step becoming more connected with your fellow mankind. And that's what I have for you. Okay. Thank you. That's that's very kind. Now, um, I just um, because we're already wrapping up, um, Vicky, it's, it's really um a, a pleasure hearing about your research and how it intersects with other um areas of positive psychology and developmental psychology. But um, tell us what else is in the pipeline, and again, um, remind us how to get in touch with you. What platforms can we get get in touch with you at? Okay. Um. Well, first of all, for to get con the best way to contact me is through my email and my email is vsg16 at msstate.edu and i'm happy to to respond to emails i love getting emails um you know that's part of one way i battle loneliness so um, and i love talking about anything uh, psychology. So, you know, and if you have ideas on, on research, you know, feel free to send ideas on, on research. Um, so that's one way to get a hold of me. What I've got in the loop right now, as you, 
as you know, is I'm conducting research um, on the effects of COVID on students at different levels, academic performance as well as their social or it will act their psychological well-being. And why this is so important is if you think about this, Dennis, if you are a uh, uh, you were a junior or senior in high school when this uh, pandemic bro broke out, which two of my grandchildren were, and now you are a freshman or sophomore in college, you may be suffering from some psychological issues such as the imposter syndrome, such as fear of failure, um, and not believing in yourself as much as you would have if you had had, had the traditional teaching, you know, in, in uh, um, school face-to-face. -face. Um, instead, they had to switch to an online platform. Some students thrived in the online platform, some did not. And so I'm interested in all the ages because the age they were going through those first two years can have a detrimental effect on when they are juniors and seniors in college, and then again in their PhD programs. Uh, one of my predictions in the PhD programs, if they do not have great mentoring in those first two years, they were uh, isolated, so, socialate, so, so, isolated, socialated, well, help me here. You know what I'm trying to say. Not socially isolated. Thank you. <laughs> socially isolated, tongue twisted there. Um, you you may not have gotten the information you would have gotten face to face with people. Now you got to remember these are people who were not expecting to be online like you are doing your program online. So you wanted to do it this way um, versus being in a program being forced upon you uh, like that. So I worry in the future that we're going to have some uh, ABDs, which means all but dissertation. Um, that's very high anyway. So many students will go through a PhD program. All they have to do is do their dissertation, defend it, and they're done, and yet they don't do it. Um, and it's for a multitude of reasons. But I could see the imposter syndrome and fear of failure um, cropping in there. So I'm really trying to find out the big picture of this and how we can be better prepared for the next pandemic that we experience to help the students who are especially first generation low income um, or who are minority students in their yeah. country and in, in colleges to help them be able to get through this terrible time. Uh, absolutely. Well, it's it's a pleasure having you here on the DRH show, um, Dr. Um, Professor Vicky Geyer. And as, as usual, um, um, thank you for sharing to us your experience and also your expertise. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dennis, for having me. I appreciate it so much.